Good morning. Welcome back to our second episode for year, the year 2024. And we are in First Chronicles chapter 29. So if you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to take it. Let's all turn together, read the text, and then we will continue unfolding this passage of Scripture in front of us, digging into details and, and recognizing some very rich truths. So First, uh, First Chronicles, not Corinthians, 29. And uh, we'll begin in verse, nine, in verse number 9, read to verse 15. Then the people rejoiced. For that they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Then, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. For who am I, that I should, and what is my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. We are strangers before thee, and sojourners, as were our fathers, our days on the earth, are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. Now, these verses get into a second piece. I noticed or yesterday when we talked about the text in our introduction, we talked about the mindset of the people. They had offered of themselves willingly, and uh, it was not by force. It was not get by constraint. It was not through manipulation. Um, they did it as a corporate body, and we saw that aspect. But the question that we should ask when we read these kinds of scriptures is we say, well, what caused the people to do this? How is it that these people were so uh, so gracious in their gifts and they were so passionate about their gifts and they were not being manipulated into it? They were not forced into it. Well, the answer to that question is that it had everything to do with their view of God. And their view of God had everything to do with the way that David had presented him to the people. And so I want you to notice the way that David describes God and this morning, we're going to focus in on his greatness and how David describes the greatness of God. Then, Lord willing, tomorrow, we're going to look at how David views himself and the people. And this will kind of emphasize the goodness of God. And when we talk about God's attributes or his perfections, we could say some of them are attributes of greatness and some of them are attributes of goodness. It's like the difference between saying that God is omnipotent, he's all-powerful, or he's omniscient, he's all-knowing, and God is a God of grace, and God is a God of mercy, and God is a God of love, and God is a God of compassion. You see, some of those are, are, are aspects of his goodness, and some of them are aspects of his greatness, not to diminish, diminish his greatness in his grace and in his love, but those are attributes that really show how he is benevolent and kind and good towards us. And really, both of those things we will see in these verses. But before we get into all the weeds on that, um, let's, let's notice how he focuses this address. And David's ad, David is giving gratitude to God because he recognizes the magnitude of the creator and the sustainer of all things. And so let's work our way through them. In verses 10 and 13, the way that David describes God is, is fascinating. He says, blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our father. And then in verse 13, he says, all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee? Now, that statement, he's our father. And the next statement, all things come from him. And the third statement, of his own, we have given to him, is emphasizing something about God's nature. It's emphasizing that he is both the giver and he is the sustainer of life. Like, in, like it says in Colossians chapter one, it says, by him were all things created in heaven and earth. And by him, all things consist. Those scriptures emphasize he is the giver of life and he is the sustainer of life. And David is emphasizing that in the very beginning of these words. The second thing I want you to notice is that he emphasizes the eternality of God, not just that he is the giver of life, and we could say the giver of all life, and he is the sustainer of all life, but he is the eternal God. He is a God who is outside of time. That means he's not, he's not dependent on 
anybody. It says, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, for ever and ever. So the blessings that are due to him are everlasting blessings, are everlasting glories. Why? Well, because he is the everlasting God. The third statement is found in verse 11. And he is emphasizing that he is the standard by which any other form of greatness has to be compared. He says, thine, O Lord, is the greatness. He doesn't just say, you, O Lord, are great, or you, O Lord, are, are among the greatest. He doesn't say it that way. He says, you are the greatness that is emphasizing the fact that he is the standard we are going to measure greatness in terms of god what that tells you is that anything that we are trying to compare to god when it comes to this issue of greatness is going to fall short because they are not the standard he himself alone is the standard we see the same concept um, fourthly when he says he is the power He's the standard by which any form of greatness is compared and any form of might or strength is compared. He's the standard by which any glory must be compared. He says he is the glory and he is the victory. He's the standard by which any triumph must be compared. And he is the standard by which any splendor is compared, the majesty. And so when we talk about God, he describes him as the standard of glory, the standard of victory, the standard of majesty, the standard of power. Everything that we describe as majestic and as glorious and as mighty, it falls short of God in these areas. He is the standard by which they are measured, not the other way around. He also says, fifthly, that all that is in heaven and earth is his. The idea is that he owns everything. He says, thine is the kingdom, O Lord. He rules over everything. Thou art exalted as the head above all. All human authorities come from him and is answerable ultimately to him. So what we can see about these descriptions of God is that he gives life. He sustains life. He's the measure of greatness, the measure of power, the measure of victory, the measure of majesty. Everything belongs to him. He rules over all. Everything's accountable to him. He is the ultimate authority over everything. And I ask this question, why does David start there? Well, because this is what allows us to appreciate his goodness. His goodness is given to us in the light of his greatness. And this is what makes a person grateful, is they recognize this great God who is so good, is good to me, a mere mortal, who has nothing really to offer him, and who is ultimately flawed and fallible and, and full of troubles. This great God loves me. <clears throat> he set his mercy and his grace upon me. That is the sense of the text in front of us. And so David uses this tremendous redundancy to reveal that there's really no way to perfectly and fully describe the greatness of God. He is incomprehensible. Now, what I mean by that is not that we can't know him at all. It's that we can never know him fully. If I say that God is great, my understanding of his greatness is always going to fall short of the full measure of his greatness. And if I talk about God being glorious or victorious or majestic, my comprehension of those things and my ability to describe the fullness of those things will always fall short. And that is because you cannot adequately describe a God who is incomprehensible and who cannot be contained. That's why you cannot grasp his greatness because everything that you use to compare him to falls short. We can comprehend the comprehensible. We cannot fully comprehend the incomprehensible. And so we always think of God in terms that fall short. And what that does is that causes us to humble ourselves and when we come into a series of circumstances where we can't make full sense of it, we have to submit our wills to the Lord and say, God, I don't fully understand this. 
I don't fully grasp what you're doing. I fit, can't fully appreciate the fullness of what you're doing, but I can trust you because I know you're bigger and stronger and wiser than me. And I'm dependent on you. You're not dependent on me. That's where all of our gratitude should start. And so I want to encourage you this morning as you reflect on these things, let's be a people who have a big view of the greatness of God. And we never get over the fact that this wonderful God, who we cannot fully comprehend, who cannot be contained, this great God cares about us as individuals. He cares about us personally, and he demonstrated his care and his love for us through the work of Christ. May that give us something to think about today. Well, if this has been encouragement to you, please take a moment to share that. And Lord willing, tomorrow we'll continue to unpackage this passage of scripture. Have a blessed morning. Bye now.